going to continue part four of the life of Moses. I started teaching this series uh, several weeks back. Last week, I didn't teach on it because we had guest speakers. We had guest speakers here last, last week. So I'm picking back up and, and getting back into the life of Moses. So um, let, me, let me just, let's proceed here just for a minute here. Um, I've said this before, but I want to get into it a little bit deeper and probably share some things that you never heard before. Probably, I hope. Hope I can bless you. Moses is a prophetic picture of Christ in the Old Testament. Sometimes Bible scholars refer to him as a prophetic shadow of Jesus. He is mentioned 767 times in the Old Testament. He is the most dominant person in the Old Testament. 767 times. He is mentioned actually 79 times in the New Testament. Moses gave us the dispensation of law. He gave us the law. He is the most prominent, I mean, Jesus, I'm sorry, he is not the most prominent figure in the New Testament, though, because Jesus Christ becomes the most prominent figure figure in the New Testament. Jesus gave us the dispensation of grace. Moses gave us the dispensation of law. Jesus gave us the dispensation of grace. Moses is Jewish. Jewish. Now remember, he is a, Moses is just a prophetic picture. He's a shadow of Christ, of the, the true Savior that's coming, okay? Moses is Jewish. Jesus Christ is Jewish. At Moses' birth, Pharaoh tried to kill him. At the birth of Jesus, Herod tried to kill Jesus. Moses was sent by God to deliver the children of Israel out of the oppression and slavery of Egypt. Jesus came to deliver us from the oppression and slavery of sin. Moses was rejected by his own people. Jesus was rejected by, and crucified by his own people. Moses was raised in a home where he had no biological father. Jesus was raised in a home where Joseph was not his biological father. Moses' ministry began after an encounter with God at a burning bush in the wilderness. Jesus' ministry began after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness. Also, Moses... By the power of God, did signs and wonders in the wilderness. Jesus was God incarnate and did many signs and wonders. Amen. Including walking on the water and raising the dead. Amen. Praise God. Now, we don't know of any instance of, of Moses raising the dead. So Jesus did greater miracles, greater signs because he was God incarnate. Moses saved the children of Israel with a sacrifice upon a pole. And in John, the third chapter, we read this. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. That whosoever or whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Jesus saved us by being lifted up on a cross as our sacrifice. The, I want you to think for a moment here about we're, we're talking about the life of Moses, so we're going to get into a little bit of uh, facts about his life. Think about the logistics of what happened, of what was done whenever Moses took the children of Israel out of Egypt. I mean, it's incredible what happened. It, it, was, it was from the very moment well, we know the miracles began in Egypt when God sent, you know, all the different plagues that came up on Egypt. And yet in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel lived, there was no plagues at all. But he turned the water into blood all throughout Egypt, except in the land of Goshen. He sent frogs all through the land of Egypt, except in the land of Goshen. He sent flies and hail and darkness during the middle of the day all through the land of Egypt, but not in the land of Goshen. So... 
When this happened, the miracles were already occurring before they left Egypt. But when they went into the wilderness, God even did greater miracles. Think about this for a moment. Think about what it took to get the children of Israel out of Egypt and through the wilderness into the promised land. Think about it. Calculations have been done by mathematical experts and they, they found that if, and you remember I mentioned a while ago, if you remember, I said from 2 million to 6 million people, that's what most of all the expert Bible theologians think, that that's how many people left Egypt. But let's just pick a number close to the center. How about if they found that if 3.5 million people, 3.5 million people traveled from, the promise, um, uh, from Egypt to the promised land, Moses needed, he needed to feed them. He had to feed them 1,500 tons. Look at your neighbor and say tons. 1,500 tons of food a day. Every day. And you say, how much food is that? Well, maybe this will help, help you get a picture. That would require a freight train two miles long, two miles long, every day filled with food, delivering them food every single day. Now we know God supplied them with manna from heaven, but if Moses was supplying food, that's what it would have took to feed the children of Israel and then all the animals and the oxen and the goats and the sheep and stuff that were with them in order, that, in order that they might stay alive every day. A freight train two miles long filled with food. And they were in the wilderness for 40 years. 40 years. How about water? If they only had water to drink, and we're not talking about showering, that would have been a convenience that they didn't, they couldn't, they, they didn't have the water for, okay? I don't know how often they took baths, but I don't think they took them very often. If they only had enough water to drink for themselves and for the animals, and possibly to wash a few dishes every day, it's all the water they had. They averaged using 11 million gallons of water a day. You say, help me understand, Pastor, how much is 11 million gallons of water? Well, that's enough water to fill two trains of tanker cars, each train being two miles long. Think about a two mile long train and you got two trains. That's a total of four miles of tanker cars filled with water. Every day, now look at your neighbor and say every day. That's how much water it took every day for them to stay alive. And the animals and the oxen and the sheep and the goats. So the miracles started happening in the land of Egypt and it happened all the way through the whole story, the whole journey, all the way from Egypt to the promised land. Miracles were occurring every day, every day. Someone else calculated this, that for three and a half million people to be able to get across the Red Sea in one night, they needed a path through the water at the Red Sea that was approximately three miles wide. Three miles wide. So that tells me that the movie, the, the Ten Commandments, the movie with Charlton Heston is a little bit wrong. I mean, when you look at that movie, you know, you watch that, it, it is awesome. I mean, the water's standing up by on the wall. And probably 100, maybe 200 feet there wide, they're all walking across. You could have never gotten them across in one night. With a, with, a with a 200 foot wide path. It took a path 
three miles wide for the children of Israel to get across in one night. For them to get their cows, their sheep, their oxen, their carts, their wagons, and themselves, and possibly a few belongings through the Red Sea in one night, took a path three miles wide. Moses was a man of faith. Exodus 14, 13 says, And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Don't be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more. They're standing at the Red Sea. They got the mountains on one side. They can either turn around and go back to, to, uh, and run face to face into the armies of Pharaoh, or they could march this way to, back to Egypt. They could go back to Egypt, but they're standing here at the Red Sea. They've really got nowhere to go. They're trapped. And Moses says, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Now, when he said that, he didn't know what God was going to do. And I'm going to show you the scripture here in just a minute. He had no clue what God was going to do next. See what he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see, you're not going to see them no more again forever. How do you know that, Moses? Because here's what the scripture says. The Lord will fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Now that's faith. To speak that and he didn't know what was about to happen. That's faith. And the Lord said to Moses. Now this is what the Lord said to Moses. Why do you cry to me? Why are you calling out to me? Now this was after he had already told the children, children of Israel. He said, stand still and see the salvation of God. For the, the Egyptians that you see today, you're not going to see them no more. Boy, that's faith. He's speaking by faith because he has no clue what's going to happen next. And then he goes somewhere probably and gets in his tent in verse 15 here, Exodus 14, 15. And he's crying out to the Lord, oh God, oh God now, I, I'm, I'm, out on a, I'm out on a limb here. God, I need your help. And the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Have you ever been in that place? Boy, have I. I've been there quite a few times actually. But you know what? That's faith. You've got to step out by faith and trust God and believe God. Most people, and I'm going to go ahead and say, most people who go in business for themselves have a lot of faith. They build businesses by faith. We got people in our church building businesses. Amen. It takes a lot of faith to build your own business because you got to trust God that God is going to meet the need. Amen. Why do you cry out to me, Moses? And God said to Moses, he said, you tell the children of Israel to go forward. Now, I've told this story before, but for the benefit of anybody watching online and maybe one or two or three people here that, or a few people here that don't know this story, that word go forward, that really means a lot to my wife and I. Because before we came here to start the church, uh, before we rented the school at Tom Green Elementary and started having church, my wife was seeking God. She was praying. She was really questioning God about it. God, is this what you want us to do? And we, God had spoken to us several times. We knew God wanted us to do this because God, we were called out. We were prophesied over in a church of hundreds and hundreds of people. They called us out, prophesied over us. And uh, so... Uh, one night, my wife was driving home. She'd been to a ladies' uh, church meeting all day, and she was on her way home, and she was praying. And she said, God, what, what, what am I supposed to do? And the children were asleep in the, back of the, in the back of the car. It was my wife. And she said she heard a voice. And she came home and told me about this. And I mean, it made like the hair stand up on the back of my neck. She said she heard a voice behind her, a deep voice that said, go forth. Go forward, go forth. And she looked, she thought a man was in the back seat of the car because it was night. She tried to look back and the kids were back there asleep. Go forward, go forward, go forth. 
And then she came home and she told me all about it. I never will forget. She, came, she, she said, I heard a voice. She said, I've never heard, literally heard the voice of God said, go forward. God said, go forward. So about a year and a half goes by. We come over here. We, we started the church in the school. We rented. We actually rented a classroom to start with because we didn't have the money to rent the cafeteria or to rent the gymnasium. So we rented a classroom and we're in that classroom having church. And every Sunday we put out these little A-frame signs all around the school, leading people to the back parking lot, showing them where we were having church with arrows, you know, little arrows. You just follow the arrows and go to the back parking lot and you can, you can go in the church. So we're in front of Tom Green Elementary one day after church, picking up the signs. After church, I had to go back and pick them all up. There was like eight or 10 signs that I would put out at the different intersections and all around. And so I'm out there in front of the school, Tom Green Elementary, picking up a sign, folding it, and about to put it in the back of the car, in the trunk of the car. And my wife is sitting in the car with the kids and she suddenly screams, literally screams. And it kind of scared me. I thought something was wrong. I dropped the sign. I ran over to the door. What's wrong, darling? Are you okay? She says, our church, our church. Now, my wife, I want to say this about her. She knows how to speak three languages very fluently, Ukrainian, Russian, and English. She's smarter than me. So I don't mean her, I don't mean to sound like she's not very smart by saying this, but because she's living in a foreign culture, she grew up speaking a different language. She sometimes doesn't catch things quite as quickly or as fast as she'll overlook things easier than I would because she didn't grow up speaking English. And she says, the sign, the sign. And there's a street sign up there that says, go, go forth road. And she said, our church is on go forth road. You remember a year and a half ago, God said to me, go forth. And I said, you're right. He did, didn't he? So tell the children of Israel to go forward. Go forward. So that's that story, but it was a confirmation. If you look on the map today, Tom Green Elementary is on Go Forth Road in Kyle. And well, it's in Buda, I think. I think it's in Buda. But it's on Go Forth Road is where it's located. And my wife just, you know, to her, that was just comfort, another confirmation. We were where God wanted us to be. Moses used what God gave him. He used what he had to accomplish the will of God. You know, time and time again, God spoke to Moses and said, use your rod. He said in verse 16, he said, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. Lift that rod out over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Paul in the New Testament used his education to write about two-thirds of the New Testament. Did you know that? He was educated, the Bible says, at the feet of Gamal. Gamal was a very, uh, very highly educated philosopher, man in his day that's famous from 2,000 years ago. There's other books besides the Bible that write about Gamal. Gamal was a very famous Roman t a teacher in Rome. And uh, Paul was very highly educated way more educated than the Apostle Peter. You know, the Apostle Peter was a fisherman. Peter wrote two books in the New Testament, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, that's it. Paul wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament, two-thirds of it. He used his education. And actually, even though he was highly educated, he had to write a lot of that while he was in prison. He probably spent, nobody knows for certain, but theologians think he probably spent about a third of his ministry, the time that he was preaching, about a third of his time in jail, in prison, for preaching the gospel. So he used his education to write about two-thirds of the New Testament as the Holy Spirit and God spoke to him what to write. And everybody ought to know this one. What did David use? Come on, come on. Are y'all with me? Are y'all with me? What did David use? A sling. A sling. He used a sling and a stone, right? 
to kill a giant. He said, he said to his brothers, his brothers, came, you know, he went to, to, to give food to his brothers. This father sent him to take like lunch to his brothers. And his brother said, and he said to his brothers, he said, who is this uncircumcised Philistine standing out there in the, in the valley challenging the armies of the living God? Challenging our armies. Who is this guy? And they're like, oh, you don't want to mess with him, man. He's, he's, a, he's a hero. He's been a fighter all his life. He's their champion. He's the champion of the Philistine army. You know, the Bible says he was about nine feet tall. David says, I'll, I'll take on this, this uncircumcised, ungodly giant. I'll take him on. And with a sling and a stone. That's all you're going to use, David? He said, the same God that delivered the, the lion into my hands who came to kill my father's sheep when I was, when I was herding sheep for my, for my father, the same, the same God that delivered me from the bear when the bear came to kill my father's sheep when I was, when I was, deliver, when I was protecting or, or shepherding my father's sheep, I'll kill that giant with, a, with a, the same way I kill the lion, the same way I kill the, the bear, I will kill that giant. Hallelujah. Praise God. God wants to use whatever you've got today. Hallelujah. Whatever you've got, he wants to use it. Praise God. Give him praise. Hallelujah. So you may say, well, pastor, all I can do is this. I can't sing. I can't get up and preach like you do. I can't, uh, I, you know, I'm not a real Bible scholar. I don't know a whole lot about the Bible. I just read the Bible, but I, some of it, I don't even understand it. You know, you might say, well, I, I can't, uh, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a real highly educated person. All I can do is, is uh, hang doors or all I can do is paint, you know, or all I can do. Let me tell you something. There's something that you can do in the kingdom of God. There's something that God has for you to do. You, he wants you to take your rod. Uh, Moses, what is that you've got in your hand? It's just a rod. It's just a rod. That's all like a staff, you know, like a staff, Lord. That's all it is. That rod, take it and throw it down on the ground. He threw it down on the ground. It became a snake. Amen. I don't know how they did it, but for somehow or another, whenever Moses went before the Pharaoh, the Bible says the Egyptian magicians, they threw their rods down and their rods became snakes. But And I don't know how they did it. It was a trick for them. I don't, I don't believe they had the power to turn a, to turn a rod into a snake no more than I believe there's a man in the moon. I don't believe that. Hallelujah. I mean, somehow or another, they, they tricked Pharaoh into believing that they threw their rods down and their rods turned into snakes. But you know what happened? Moses threw his rod down and it really did turn into a snake and it swallowed up their snakes. Hallelujah. It swallowed up all their snakes that were there. In other words, signifying my God's greater than your God. Your God's not even alive. Hallelujah. There's only one God. There's only one living true God. Amen. Amen. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. So what's that you got? It's a rod. He turned it into a snake. And when he was standing at the Red Sea, he said, lift up your rod and part the waters. Part the waters. The widow of Zapharath in Elijah's day, she used the last bit of meal. Now think about this. She used, all she had was a little bit of meal in a barrel and a little bit of oil in a cruise. That's all she had left. And, and you know, and, and Elijah came walking by and he looked at her and says, would you bake me? A, he, he probably saw that meal and that, that little bit of oil left. He said, would you bake me a, 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 some bread? I think today we probably would call it like a pancake or something. Would you mix that oil and, 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 that, and that meal together and make me something to eat? And this woman, this, this widow, she looks at Elijah and she says, I'm fixing to cook this for me and my son. It's all we have left to eat. And there was a famine in the land. People were dying. People were starving to death. And he said, we're going to eat this and then we're going to die. And he said, would you fix me something first? Would you make, would you make me some bread, some, some cake first? She said, okay. 
So she cooks a lot. She takes her last bit of meal and her oil and mixes a cake and cooks it for Elijah. And she gives it to Elijah. And she goes back to that meal barrel where the barrel, where the meal was in the bottom of the barrel. And she reaches her hand down in there again in the bottom. Maybe I can get just a little bit more for my son and I. And there's, there's plenty. There's a handful. She pulls it, pulls it all out. And for two and a half years, think about this. For two and a half years, every time she came back to the meal barrel, she reached down and she, there was more meal in the meal barrel. And every time she went to that little cruise of oil, there was more oil in that cruise and she mixed it together. God provided for her for two and a half years throughout the entire remainder of the famine. God provided for her because she put God first. She gave God the first thing she gave that she made from that meal and that oil was for Elijah. Hallelujah. That's faith. That's faith. That's how faith works. Hallelujah. When you take care of what God wants you to do first, when you do what God's called you to do first, hallelujah, then he provides for everything else. He takes care of everything else. He supplies all the rest of the needs. That's what he's done for us over and over and over. My God has met the need over and over and over again. If you'd have told me just five years ago, even. I know you may sound like I'm bragging a little bit, but I'm going to say, if you'd have told me just five years ago that we're going to be sitting with a piece of land worth over half a million dollars, paid, paid off, paid for, I'd say, I don't see how in the world, I, you know. But I had faith. I did, I did say, I don't know, but I, I, you know, I'd have found it hard to believe. Amen. God is good. Hallelujah. And when you put him first in everything, he always supplies the need. Hallelujah. And that little widow, she took that last bit of meal and that oil and made a cake for Elijah. And God supplied her needs for two and a half years. He supplied her needs until the famine ended. Until the famine ended. Esther, she used her position as a queen. To, and she put her life on the line. To save her people. Whatever you have, regardless of how great it is, regardless how, how great the position is, or how small or how little the position is, regardless of how much you might have or how little you might have, when you take it and you give it to God, He's able to take that little and He's able to make do something great through your life. He's able to bless you, hallelujah, in a great way. Praise God. Give him praise. Hallelujah. Take whatever God's given you, whatever he's given you, and use it to accomplish God's will. That's what Moses did. Moses was a very humble man. He was a very humble man. Numbers 12, 3 says, And now the man Moses was very humble, more than all men who were on the face of the earth. He was a humble man. I believe that in order, that in order for you to uh, really be used of God, you have, to, you have to have a humble attitude. That doesn't mean that you can't be grateful and that you can't boast in how good God is and how great God is. He loves for us to give him glory. Amen. He loves for us to boast about his power and his goodness and his love and what he's done. Not what I've done, it's what he's done. Hallelujah, that's what really matters. He was more humble than all the men who were on the face of the earth. Moses was a praying man. If you'll tell the youth that we're done. Moses was a praying man. Numbers 21.6 says, So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. And they bit the people. And many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take away the serpents from us. Now, this they had been criticizing Moses. Look at this. Look at this. Here's why he was a humble man and he was a praying man. They had been criticizing Moses 
criticizing their lead, leader, blaming him for every problem they had, complaining and complaining and complaining and complaining. And they came to him and says, please, Moses, pray for us. So Moses prayed for the people. Could you pray for somebody that's been complaining about everything you're doing? Would you be willing? If somebody was complaining about everything that you're doing in your life and talking about how no good you were and how sorry you were and how they didn't like you and how they wished that they'd have never met you. But then an emergency, something bad happened in their life and they come to you and they say, oh, please, please pray for me. Pray, pray for me. Would you pray for them? Would you pray for him? That's what Moses did. I believe not only did he pray for him, but I believe he forgave him. He forgave him. So Moses prayed for the people. He prayed for them. He was a praying man. Then the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when they're bitten by one of these snakes, when he looks at it, he'll live. They'll live. They shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and he put it on a pole. So it was, if a serpent serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. Moses was a praying man. He was a humble man. He used what God gave him. And he was a man of faith. But I want to mention this in the very end. I want you to keep in mind. He was a very imperfect man. He was very imperfect in many ways. Sometimes people don't like for me. I've had people say, Pastor, don't say that. Well, it's the truth. He was a murderer. He murdered a man. Paul was a murderer in the New Testament. He murdered Christians. You don't have to be perfect to be used of God. No matter how big you might have messed up in the past, no matter how big a mistake you might have made in your life, I want you to know Jesus loves you and he wants you now by faith to give him what you have and let him use your life. Let him bless your life. Makes no difference what you've done. Hallelujah. Jesus still loves you. That's the good news today. Hallelujah. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You know, I'm so glad that scripture doesn't say that. So whoever lives a really good life and does great deeds shall have everlasting life. I'm so glad it doesn't say that. I'm so glad that that passage says, whoever believes, put your faith in him, trust in Jesus. And no matter how bad you might have messed up, just trust Jesus. Hallelujah. He's going to do great things in my life. Look at your neighbor and say, he's going to do great things in my life. He's going to do great things in my life. Hallelujah. God's going to do great things. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. It makes no difference how bad. You might have messed up. You worship the Lord as as the praise team sings.